when I received that phone call from my teenage son, worse for wear on the other end of the phone, Jack can't stand up, he said. Can you come and pick us up? I realised we would have to deal with one of the most challenging habits for both teenagers and parents to manage. Drugs and alcohol use and abuse. By 15, more than 70% of teenagers have tried alcohol and the numbers keep on rising as they get older. Binge drinking, which is consuming at least four or five drinks in a two hour period, typically begins around 13 and peaks between 18 and 22. In fact, cannabis is outpacing alcohol as a public health problem in teenagers, being responsible for more than 70% of admissions to rehabilitation centres. And cannabis is by far the most commonly used illicit drug, with 30%, 37% of teenagers saying they've tried it at least once. So what are the effects of alcohol and cannabis on your teenager's brain? Well, we can say with absolute certainty that both alcohol and cannabis are harmful to your teenager's developing and vulnerable brain. So let's start with alcohol. Contrary to popular opinion, adolescent brains, compared to adult brains, are actually much better at handling the sedative aspects of drinking, including drowsiness, hangovers, and a lack of coordination. Alcohol doesn't produce the same level of inhibition in their brain, which means greater tolerance and more incentive for them to actually keep drinking. However, this tolerance for the immediate effects of drinking belies the long-term consequences and damage they are doing to their brain. Damage to cognitive, behavioral, emotional, functioning inside their brain. Attention deficits, depression, memory problems have all been linked to alcohol abuse in teenagers. The damage appears to be worse in girls because their brains develop slightly earlier than boys. But alcohol actually shrinks the size and reduces the efficiency of their prefrontal cortex here, the part responsible for rational thinking, emotional regulation and planning, and also the hippocampus shrinks as well, which is part the part responsible for learning and memory. And the earlier the use of alcohol in the teenage years, and the longer the abuse, the smaller their hippocampus will actually become. So alcohol also blocks glutamate receptors that are key for building new connections between brain cells. And this explains why people who drink heavily have major memory problems. So when alcohol consumption is moderate, you suffer what are called cocktail party memory problems. The kind of memory loss where you forget someone's name or part of a conversation. When binge drinking results in a blackout, which is a period of time when you just can't remember entire periods of time or even events themselves, the damage to the hippocampus can be severe and stops the ability to actually lay down new long-term memories. And about 50% of college and university teenagers say they have experienced blackouts at some time and alcohol damages memory much more readily in adolescents than it does in adults. Alcohol stops teenagers growing new neurons and kills old neurons in a process that is actually really similar to having a seizure or a stroke. So what about cannabis? Well, cannabis is the only plant that contains a class of compounds called cannabinoids, including tetrahydrocannabinol, THC for short, one reason that THC has such a potent effect on us is that our brain makes its own can cannabinoids. So we have natural can cannabinoid receptors on neurons ready to receive the THC. And THC is what produces the high from cannabis, the lack of coordination, which happens by affecting the cerebellum at the back of the brain here, slurred speech and visual distortions by acting on sensory brain areas also at the back of the brain. And that sense of awe, color, colors are more beautiful, music is more profound, taste is more acute, by acting on a part of the brain called the amygdala, where cannabinoid receptors are particularly high in number. So a critical issue for teenagers who consume cannabis is that THC disrupts the development of brain pathways and the wiring, which are still being laid down inside the teenage brain. So this is much more harmful than in, than in a fully formed adult brain. And parents sometimes wonder why teenagers spoke, smoke cannabis to relax. Well, part of the answer is that the adolescent brain is much more active and vulnerable to stress. 
So it has an increased desire for relief, which teenagers often believe cannabis can actually provide. So the age at which teenagers start using cannabis is the most important factor for potential long-term brain damage. Early teenagers are twice as likely to become addicted to cannabis. And those who take cannabis before 16 years old have more trouble with focus and attention and make twice as many mistakes on tests which involve planning, flexibility and abstract thinking. Memory is also impaired, like alcohol, and memory loss lasts for longer in teenagers than in adults and in some cases for months or for years. And in terms of the consequences for mental illness, cannabis consumption in the teenage years doubles the risk of psychosis, schizophrenia and episodes of clinical depression later in life. So the increased risk for mental illness all comes about because cannabis permanently changes the incomplete and vulnerable teenage brain. So why do teenagers drink alcohol and smoke cannabis? What are the risk factors for them? Well, teenagers whose brains are still developing are easily influenced by their immediate surroundings and environment, including the habits and behaviours of those closest to them, their friends and family, for example. Young teenagers who regularly watch films with scenes of people drinking alcohol are twice as likely as teenagers who don't watch these films to drink alcohol and even to binge drink. Novelty seeking, poor judgment and risk taking are partly to blame for teenage drinking, but there is a social aspect to it as well. Studies have found that teenagers tend to base their drinking and drug taking on the amount they perceive their friends to be consuming. So if your son's best mate downs a six pack every night, chances are your son will too. Even more worrying is that this study also found that teenagers tend to overestimate the amount of alcohol or drugs that others consume. So even if your son's best mate is only drinking three beers, your son may actually perceive him as drinking a six pack. So one of the biggest risk factors for adolescents who drink and take drugs is a family history of alcohol and drug abuse. 50% of the risk of developing alcohol and drug dependence is genetically influenced, but the environment you grow up in, however, counts for the other 50%. And children, especially teenagers, model their behavior on the adults who are most important to them and with whom they, who they most frequently interact. So those who are monitored closely by their parents or guardians who are given clear rules are less likely to abuse alcohol and drugs. And a study of 300 parents and teens found that parents who disapproved of underage drinking or drug taking tended to have teenagers who engaged in less binge drinking and cannabis smoking when they got to college or university. Whereas those parents who were less strict and more accepting of adolescent drinking and drug taking were more likely to have teenagers that engaged in heavy drinking and drug taking at college or university. On the other hand, Parents who are open and willing to talk to their children about alcohol and drugs in this study had a more positive influence on their subsequent drinking and drug taking behavior. So there's no doubt that alcohol and drugs are harmful to our teenage children's brains and that we as parents and their friends influence their relationship with alcohol and drugs. Okay, so let's finish up with some practical strategies for managing alcohol and drug taking with your teenager. So now to the strategies that you can try out at home with your teenager to support them around drug and alcohol use. Remember, these are not intended to create more work for you at a time when you may already be feeling overwhelmed with the demands of parenting a teenager. Instead, this section of our lessons is designed to help you to put into practice your new understanding of why your teenager behaves in the ways that they do and to improve your relationship with them. So, firstly, it's important to think about how you educate your teenager on both the risks and the rewards of alcohol and drugs. Ideally, this needs to be done slowly as young people are impressionable and they're hungry for information, but it needs to be provided in manageable chunks. If we can provide them with the pros and the cons, we're helping them to make informed, safe, and healthy decisions around their own behaviours and choices. Secondly, 
Our children and teenagers learn from the models being provided to them by those around them. So, ensure that you're doing your best to be a responsible role model. Through what you're demonstrating to your teenager around your own behaviour, you will be influencing their attitude and their choices when they come to have their own first experiences with alcohol or drugs. Next, it's important not to be afraid of talking openly and honestly about alcohol and drugs with your teenager. The more secretive we are about it, the more curious they're going to be about it. So you may choose to maybe share your own experiences, what you've enjoyed maybe, and that might include the social aspects or offering opportunities to wind down, or perhaps what you haven't enjoyed, such as the hangovers, sickness, or the impact that it has on your ability to function the next day. But by being open and honest in this way, it will give permission to your teenager that they can be open and honest about their experiences too. It might be more beneficial to have these open and honest conversations with your teenager as a kind of drip feed discussion rather than a one-off big talk, as this may be perceived of by them as more of a kind of lecture, which is going to make it harder for them to engage with. So instead, build the conversations into natural opportunities and safe, relaxed times, rather than being a pep talk or as a means of discipline after a big night out. It's important also for us to educate ourselves about drugs and alcohol so that we can then educate our teenager accurately. This might include maybe finding out about the law around drugs, their names and their effects on our brains and bodies. It might include learning about the risks that are associated with underage drinking in terms of not only the health risks, but also placing your teenager in more vulnerable positions, whether that's around sex, crime or violence, for example. In your conversations with your teenager, be curious about their interest in drugs and alcohol in order to determine their motivation to experiment and or their level of risk that they're taking. So are they maybe just curious about the experience and wanting to fit in with their peers? Or are they using substances to mask an emotional or psychological challenge that maybe you'll be able to help them find other safer ways of managing? Are they drinking or taking drugs in unsafe places with unsafe people? Or are they with a friend who's going to look out for them if they go a bit too far? If it's the case that they're masking something, help your son and daughter to strengthen their emotional well-being in healthier ways, such as maybe exercise or sport, music, talking with friends, etc. And if you're concerned that the problems they're trying to cope with are more serious, do speak with your GP or physician for advice on additional support that they can access. Remember, your teenager's brain will mean that they're not always able to be as rational and as sensible in their choices as you can be with your adult brain. They will struggle with the off switch and they will go too far. They will make some poor choices, even with all your support. So when they do, just try and hold in mind your understanding of this. And as well as any discipline that you feel may be necessary when they do go too far, try to also stay connected with them, perhaps by making them some toast to soak up the alcohol or offering them some paracetamol the next morning. Making mistakes as a teenager is an important way of us learning how to be healthy and functional as adults. So hopefully this has offered you some thoughts and ideas on how to support your teenager around their use and experiment, experimentation with drugs and alcohol. We're very mindful that for some of you, your teenager's relationship with drugs and alcohol will be manageable, whilst for others, this may be an extremely worrying time. For those of you with teenagers who are really struggling to safely experiment, there are services to support both you and them, which you'll be able to find either on the internet or via your GP or physician. Accompanying this video, we will also provide a list of these for your reference. And as with our previous lessons, if you feel comfortable doing so, please do share any of your observations or your thoughts with us in the comments. We'd love to hear about your experiences with your teenager and how you're finding these lessons help you to understand and relate to them better. Thanks for watching and we'll look forward to seeing you in the next lesson.